study of dispute resolution here at the law school. And I want to welcome you all today to this, this symposium. And thanks, Stacy, for doing such a wonderful job of putting it together. Um, the title of this session is, What are the Goals of Judicial Education? And actually, Dr. Armitage's question, his last question, is a perfect introduction and um, to um, a segue into this session. We have three speakers, three distinguished speakers today. We have to my immediate right, your left is uh, the Honorable Mary Rhodes Russell, the Chief Justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. And she will be speaking, her title of her speech will be Toward a New Paradigm of Judicial Education and we'll focus on what we can do to make our judges more effective. Our second speaker, far side, is Professor Kathleen Mahoney from the University of Calgary, and her talk will be entitled, Why Judicial Identity, Equality, and Gender Training Still Matter? And then our third speaker will be Professor Catherine Rogers, who is a professor of law at Penn State University and a professor of regulation, ethics, and rule of law at Queen Mary University in London, where she co-directs an institute on ethics and rule of law. Um, I, I want to give a, I want them to talk rather than me, but I do want to give a brief introduction to each of our speakers. Um, Chief Justice Mary Russell is a seventh generation Missourian who grew up on a dairy farm near Hannibal, Missouri. So your fourth up would be about the same time as Mark Twain, right? The Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War, even further back. Um, she was appointed to the Missouri Supreme Court in 2005. Before that, she served on the Missouri Court of Appeals, the Eastern District, from 1995 um, to 2004, when she was appointed to the Missouri Supreme Court. Um, she went to Truman Strait University and then came to, not this building, but this law school and graduated um, um, in 1983. She was a partner in the law, in the, she, after law school, she was a um, clerk for the Honorable George Gunn at the Supreme Court and later a partner in the firm of Clayton Rhodes, Clayton and Rhodes in Hannibal until her appointment to the court. Um, she's well known, her face is familiar in this building. Um, one of the wonderful things about Judge Justice Russell is how she mentors not just our law students but, but students across Missouri. One of the things I found most fascinating is that, I want to get this right, she volunteers as a truancy court judge at Lewis and Clark Middle School in uh, Jefferson. Um, she is interested in the young people of, of this state and um, and I want to welcome her here today. Um, Professor Mahoney, as I said, is at the University of Calgary. Her scholarship interests include human rights law, humanitarian law, and judicial education and aboriginal law. She has authored several foundational pieces on judicial, judicial education and has participated in conferences on that subject throughout the world, Geneva, South Africa, Tanzania, Spain, Israel, China, Vietnam, Democratic Republic of Congo, and now Columbia, Missouri. <laughs> um, she has a long list of prestigious honors, but among the most pre prestigious was her being elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and also being named as a Trudeau Scholar in Canada. Um, she was the chief negotiator for the Assembly of First Nations, achieving his, the historic Indian residential school settlement agreement in 2007, which is the largest settlement in Canadian history, founder of Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, participated in many groundbreaking cases furthering equality for women in Canada. On an international scale, um, she was counsel for Bosnia and Herzegovina in their genocide action against Serbia in the, in the International Court of Justice. And one major result of, of that those proceedings was a redefinition of genocide to it, would, it was broadened to include mass rapes and forced pregnancies. Um, and then our third speaker is Professor Catherine Rogers, as I said, at Penn State and also Queen's, Queen Mary University. Um, she um, has published dozens of books and articles on international arbitration. I just have her current book here, which is only available in England, so the UK, but hopefully will soon be available here. Um, she has taught and lectured on international commercial arbitration around the world. Um, among her other professional appointments, Professor Rogers is a reporter for the ALI, 
their new statement on U.S. law of international commercial arbitration. She's a member of the Court of Arbitration in the Jerusalem Arbitration Court, a member of the Board of Directors of the International Judicial Academy, and co-chair of ICCA Queen Mary Task Force on third-party funding. Um, and again, our topic will be um, what are the goals of judicial education? And I want to turn it over to the Chief Justice, the Honorable Mary Grove Russell. Thank you. When lawyers don black robes to become judges, they do not magically acquire all the knowledge, experience, and skills needed to become excellent judges. They may have already, um, they may come to the bench with a particular expertise in the law, uh, but certainly not an expertise in all areas of the law. They may have certain lifetime experiences, and, but they, serve, they all have obvious limitations in decision making. More and more, judges are being called upon to play roles that extend beyond the deciding of cases. None of the judges being called upon to excel in these unfamiliar areas have received training in these matters while in law school. Thus, it is imperative that judicial education fill these gaps and equip judges to perform these functions. So that leads me to start with a question. What is the goal of judicial education for judges? Answer, to make us better judges, of course. A deceptively simple question with a deceptively simple answer until one specifically admits and attempts to try to accomplish this worthy judicial education goal and then simplicity disappears. We certainly expect such an education to include the case law and statutes and the foundation um, of sound legal decisions. Judicial education must convey the information that allows judges to develop the most comprehensive and current understanding of substantive areas of the law, as well as the law of evidence and procedure. Missouri judges have come to rely on the judicial education that we provide here in our state as their primary source of such information. That will not change. We face limitations, limitations in providing judicial education. Unfortunately, budgetary shortfalls are frequently felt most prominently in this area. The reality of fewer funds has reduced our ability to send judges to national seminars and conferences. We are compensated for this by seeking to design the most effective possible curricula for our mandatory week-long judicial colleges and new judges orientation, combining a focus, focus on the developments in the areas of civil law, criminal law, family law, juvenile law, and probate with, session, <clears throat> with sessions on skills and information that will make our judges the best professionals they possibly can be. Another limitation is the amount of time judges can be away from their courtrooms to attend educational programs. Our dockets are full and impose real limitations on the time judges can devote to educational opportunities. These limitations, no matter how substantial, should not prevent us from exploring new possibilities and options for judicial education. What about the broad range of topics that can make a judge a more effective decision maker, communicator, collaborator, and administrator? What about those areas that make us just better people? What about those matters that enhance the judiciary's understanding of the world from which cases emerge and the unique circumstances and needs um, that have shaped the parties who appear in our courtrooms. As Missouri trial court judge Carl DeMars has observed, judges deal at various times with nearly every aspect of human life, and thus there is probably almost no discipline, field of study, or practical skill, the pursuit of which would not make one a better judge in some fashion. While it's not feasible to think that judicial education can be made to encompass every discipline, field of study, or practical skill, there is considerable wisdom in Judge DeMars' belief that judges would benefit greatly from matters that go beyond changes in the law. This morning I will explore these issues and examine new directions for judicial education. First, we must know the needs of the people we serve. Judge Bruce Bullum of North Dakota once noted that the key element in the positive change or growth of the courts is education, specifically education that puts judges in the position of knowing the needs of the people we serve and having the ability to serve those needs. Many judges would agree with Judge Bowman's assertion, although for different reasons. 
Some would come to an altruistic perspective, understanding that this sort of knowledge allows judges to help those caught up in tragic circumstances. Others would see it from a more pragmatic perspective, building on the old adage that knowledge is power and the most effective decisions will occur in the context of awareness and expertise. Whatever the reason, it is vital that judicial education position judges to know the world from which their cases will emerge and to understand the world in which the rulings will be enforced. The public in recent years has come to expect courts to be problem solvers in areas where traditionally judges have never been involved. With the creation of problem solving and specialty courts follows the need for specialized training for judges involved. One such specialty court is designed for people with addictions and substance abuse. When we are dealing with the area, of whether it's civil or criminal law, or when we hear a case in probate or even juvenile court, it is likely that many of the cases will have roots in substance abuse and parties will be involved and will be linked to some sort of addiction. Whatever the sad and specific nature of the multitude of these sort of cases, it is essential that the judges who hear them understand the impact of substance abuse and addiction. Judicial education plays an essential role in providing this sort of knowledge. Whether it sheds light on the actions of the parties involved or shapes the rulings that are crafted to achieve a just result, education is an essential element in judges dealing effectively with this pervasive problem. Treatment courts have been especially successful utilizing a melding of supervision and accountability with opportunity and possibility. We have more treatment courts in Missouri per capita than any other state. By this point, may, many of us are aware of the results produced. Graduates of such programs staying clean and out of trouble, reduction in crime rates far more impressive than the more harsh alternatives, and the cost savings of avoiding incar incarceration and recidivism. While most of us know that treatment courts can work, not many of us know how to create or operate them. This is another area in which I would like to see an expansion of judicial education. We need to meet, move beyond extolling the personal, the virtue of treatment courts, and offer more programming or best practices for making treatment courts the most effective. Meanwhile, funds for mental health treatment facilities have dwindled in recent years. Many of these suffering, many people suffering from mental illness have ended up in the courts. Dealing effectively with those plagued by mental illness strains the talent and ability of experts. For judges, most of who have no expertise on such matters, handling such a situation will prove difficult for all except those possessing exceptional crisis management skills. The Conference of Chief Justices identified mental illness as a far-reaching problem with enormous impact on the judicial system. It is almost inevitable that judges will encounter parties suffering from mental illness in our courts, yes, yet most judges receive no specialized training on dealing with parties suffering from mental illness. It is essential that judicial education equip them with the knowledge and the tools they need to deal with this reality. The American Psychiatric Foundation and the Council of State Governments Justice Center have worked with the National Judicial College to create programs that enhance a judge's ability to interact effectively with individuals suffering from mental illness. Missouri judges, like judges throughout the nation, would benefit from this program. This is the kind of judicial education that addresses a situation that is epidemic in our courts. It is truly, a judicial, it is truly judicial education <coughs> that matters. Another area that judges need more training in is informing them of the realities of domestic violence. Far too long, domestic violence has occurred behind closed doors and has been viewed as nobody's business, not within the purview of the courts. Thankfully, this has changed. However, we still have a long way to go. At times, our domestic violence jurisprudence is still plagued by the assumptions and stereotypes of the past. We cannot expect 19th century ideas to serve our society in the 21st century. At other times, the courts operate under the mistaken belief that domestic violence cases are the same as any other kind of case. 
The needs of domestic violence victims must be considered to break the cycle of misery that may continue for generations. Judges must be made aware of the resources available that they can utilize to help the parties. Not all domestic violence cases are the same, and judges need to be fully prepared to deal with the range of situations that they may encounter. Missouri will be holding a domestic violence summit in 2015 to help judges across the state better understand the complexities involved in this sort of case. Complicating the matter further is the fact that domestic violence frequently occurs in combination with substance abuse and mental illness. To address only one aspect is to turn a blind eye toward additional elements of the problem that will prevent the effective resolution of the situation. Yet this is an approach that our system employs with regularity. Although each of these treatment systems are separate silos, judges need, must be given the knowledge about the needs of the family, all the needs of the family, and address them holistically. Judges, judges must also recognize the changing composition of our population. According to the U.S. Bureau of the Census, 4% of the population of Missouri is foreign born. Almost half of these individuals speak English less than very well. 6% of the Missouri population speaks a language other than English at home. With these realities forming the backdrop, it is very likely that our judges will encounter a situation in which they will have to meet the needs of limited English proficient and LEP individuals. This is another area in which judicial education is essential. First, it is essential that judges recognize their obligations under the law. Both Missouri and federal law require that state paid interpreters be provided in all legal proceedings in which a non-English speaking person is a party or a witness. Judges must be aware of the options available to them in discharging their legal obligations and providing interpretation services for the LEP population. Today, our judges are frequently required to make rulings on scientific and technological issues. In recent decades, advances in science and technology have come at a dizzying pace. Dizzying pace. Judges who are oblivious to these advances will suffer the consequences, as will justice. To issue such rulings out of ignorance is to risk the very foundations of justice. Not only do judges have to be informed on new areas of science and technology, they are also required to reconsider what has been seen as accepted and previously considered trusted evidence. It is imperative that the education that judges receive allows them to make informed decisions on these most difficult issues. The Advanced Science and Technology Adjudication Resource, ASTAR project, was created by Ohio and Maryland courts and the Einstein Institute for Science, Health, and the Courts. ASTAR provides training to judges on how to knowledgeably handle cases with scientific and technological elements and implications. In Missouri, we have over 30 judges participating in the ASTAR program. Establishing us as one of the most effectively trained judiciaries in the country on these matters. These A star judges are available to hear cases in which scientific and technological issues are involved that are beyond a trial judge's expertise. In addition, the Trial Judge Education Committee has created numerous seminars on science and technology for Missouri judges. The centerpiece of my platform is Chief Justice has been a focus on how our courts can better serve all Missourians. In my meetings with judges, lawyers, and litigants on how our courts can do so, both large and small circuits throughout the state have echoed a similar interest, the education of judges who would be specially trained in matters of complex litigation. Included in this category of complex litigation would be cases involving sophisticated business matters, mass torts, multiple parties, lengthy trials, and complicated discovery. Once again, judicial education is an essential part of making this happen. In 2014, we partnered with the National Judicial College to offer a multi-day seminar on complex litigation. Over 30 judges stepped forward to be a part of the core of this complex litigation specialist 
and we're training on issues including forensic accounting, trade secrets, and e-discovery. Trial judges hearing cases that can be deemed complex will be able to request appointment of one of the specially trained judges. This represents yet another example of judicial education playing a vital role in addressing the problems created by our ever-changing society. Another reality of our modern courts is the increasing presence of self-represented litigants, numbering in the tens of thousands each year. There are many reasons for this. Some result to self-representation out of necessity, unable to find an attorney they can afford or to secure the assistance of legal aid. For others, it's a matter of geography. More than three-fourths of all Missouri attorneys practice in just six counties, including the city of St. Louis. Only a quarter of all attorneys practice in the remaining 109 counties where nearly 60% of our population lives. The presence of self-represented litigants creates a plethora of issues for judicial education. There is a compelling need for best practices to most effectively serve the parties. Some assert that the self-represented litigants are not receiving the same level of justice as those represented by counsel. <clears throat> Judicial education will play a role in preventing this from occurring. At the same time, judges must find a way to balance the, their protection of interest of the self-represented with their obligations to be impartial. It is precisely because cases involving self-represented litigants are so complex and have the potential for so much frustration and consternation that it is imperative for judicial education to provide guidance and insights on how to navigate these complex waters. There are many duties required by judges today, as judges play a greater role in administration of courts. Some are becoming involved in budgetary matters, whether from the perspective of creating and monitoring the court's budget are presenting and justifying it to the legislature or to the governor. In addition, some judges are immersed in matters of managing human resources, either by creating policies for the court, participating in the resolution of complaints raised by staff, or serving as a sounding board for court personnel facing important life situations. Finally, some judges are being asked to take on the role of project manager, or are be given responsibility for overseeing initiatives as substantive and as substantial as the construction of a new courthouse. This was the case with Missouri Trial Court Judge Douglas Beach of St. Louis County, who observes, for judges, the administration of justice requires more than knowledge of the law, but also includes knowing how to find ways to make the judicial process work for citizens. Every court is constantly under pressure to construct and develop new and creative ways to carry out justice from new buildings and new programs and keeping up with the world that is changing around us. Yet another subject upon which most judges have no formal training is the use of technology. Judges need information on a wide variety of technologies from e-filing to e-bench to the use of video conferencing. Some judges are even being asked to become more involved in, deci in decision making regarding the technology that will be installed throughout the entire state. And the list of areas of judges must have knowledge in and mastery on goes on and on. Now, I've talked a lot about the substantive and procedural nature of judicial education, but what about the art of judging? Some might suggest that trying to teach the art of judging is a fool's errand. I'm sure these people would also argue that the art of judging is something that is only bestowed upon judges with time and experience on the bench as their knowledge of the law expands and their understanding of the intricacies of being a judge develops. To a certain extent, I might agree. The idea that a course on the art of judging could be designed and would transform anyone who takes it into a brilliant jurist does, in fact, border on preposterous. In a perfect world, the art of judging would be taught and learned, not in a single course, um, but in a multitude of courses, presenters and participants, whose objective is to seize every possible opportunity to explore the idea of what it means for judges to be their absolute best. This is what we should seek to accomplish with judicial education. There are a number of different models for the transmission of information about the art of judging. Each involves more experienced judges playing the role of teacher in one form or another. 
What we hope to do is to make educational experiences an opportunity for inexperienced judges to wrestle with issues and dilemmas that they will confront on the bench. Under the guidance of more experienced colleagues, the art of judging is something that is lived by both presenters and participants. In conclusion, judicial education is more than just the training of legal technicians, as judging is not a mechanical function. Judicial education is the instrument through which our profession seeks to operate at its optimum. It is the means by which the individuals who occupy one of the most important positions in our society reach their full potential. These two ideas are not distinct, but rather interrelated. It is through our development as individuals in our profession that we will make the greatest advances. In one of the landmark monographs of judicial education, Judge E.G. Knowles of Arizona wrote, we are fortunate to be in a profession where we become better at what we do by becoming better at who we are. This is an idea that is both appealing and intriguing. As we become more fully developed as human beings, we become more effective as judges. Thus, the path to emerging as the best possible judge does not stop with the accumulation of legal knowledge and expertise. Rather, it is the development of our aptitude for reason and reflection and our capacity for growth in our skills and vision that will truly distinguish us as judges. Change is inevitable. And that is a theme that has run through my talk today. No matter how much we prefer the status quo, no matter how much we are opposed to the idea of altering what we do, the simple fact of life is that change will occur. The courts must change along with the world in which they exist. Once again, we look to Judge Knowles for guidance. In these changing times, the society looks to the judiciary for stability and leadership. People want integrity and competence in all branches of government, but they expect it in the judiciary. To maintain integrity and competence and to strive for excellence in an organization, the judiciary must continue to change, to develop intelligently as an organization. The best way to change the organization is to support the ongoing development of the individuals within the organization. Thus, judicial education will play a number of roles in helping the courts to adapt to changing circumstances. It will make the case for change when change is necessary. It will present the ways in which change can be accomplished and incorporated effectively into what judges do. And hopefully, it will offer the opportunity for individual development of judges who will then be open to the change that is necessary. As Christine Durham of the Utah Supreme Court once wrote, the courts cannot be responsive to the demands for change if the people who run them do not have the capacity for growth and their own skills and vision. It is my hope that we can craft a system of judicial education that will allow and empower us as individual judges and as a judiciary as a whole to accomplish what is necessary and to make the changes required for the courts to operate at their absolute best. respect to the litigants that come before the judges. Um, I graduated from the University of British Columbia Law School in 1976, and I graduated from Cambridge University in England in 1979. At that time, uh, women comprised no more than 25% of my classes, and when I started teaching law in 1980, I found myself in a typical um, totally white male dominated context. Um, but by that time I had become profoundly aware uh, of the disadvantages experienced by women uh, in their encounters with the justice system. My study and research had told me that deeply entrenched and structural discrimination and exclusion existed in law. Exacerbating the problem as I saw it, 
was the fact that judges judging and judicial authority was overwhelmingly male, masculine, white, heterosexual, able-bodied, and class privileged. And the bias most readily observable was gender bias, especially when gender combined with other personal characteristics such as race, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, and the like. As I saw it, the problem was both um, in the law and in the composition of the judiciary, and the problem essentially was all about equality. At the law school level, it was exacerbated, the problem of equality, by the way in which the law was taught. Subjects such as contracts, constitutional law, torts, criminal law, and family law paid little or no attention to structural discrimination or bias in the legal principles, or to stereotypes that have influenced judicial decisions, or question how alternative views could be acknowledged in the resolution of legal problems. All of this at the same time that Canada was adopting a new charter of rights and freedoms, giving individual constitutional rights to Canadians for the first time, including the most comprehensive equality rights in the Western world. As a result, in 1986, I organized the first National Conference on Judicial Attitudes in Canada. It was called the Socialization of Judges to Equality Issues. The title of the conference was chosen to emphasize the importance of the social processes by which judges develop their attitudes, expectations, and values, and to convey how they are crucial to the concept of equality and fairness in judicial outcomes. It was my thought at the time that um, as, to social attitudes, as social attitudes and conditions change, judges must also change. If not, the societally induced values they hold may operate to prevent groups and individuals from achieving equality. During the conference, a judge I knew quite well from the Ontario Court of Appeal took me aside and asked me whether or not I had considered that I could be found in contempt of court. He told me that his brother judges had been discussing just that in the judicial lunchroom in Toronto because the conference program seemed to suggest judges were biased. If such allegations were left unchecked, the judges thought, they feared the judiciary could be brought into disrepute. Well, no contempt charges were laid, thank goodness. The event was very well attended, and it was a sensation in the media. The resounding conclusion of the interdisciplinary conference, made up of judges, practicing lawyers, experts in anthropology, political science, sociology, aboriginal studies, and social welfare, was that in some areas of the law, legal theory, discrimination law, family law, tort law, criminal law, child law, native or aboriginal law, and human rights law, a pattern of non-neutral or biased judicial decision-making was evident. All three components of equality, equality in law, equality in legal practice, and the social reality of equality were adversely affected when this occurred. The experts found that judges often rely on traditional limiting and inaccurate stereotypes defined by the majority group that can undermine the equality rights of disadvantaged groups and individuals. Judicial assessment of individual characteristics, abilities, and needs becomes very difficult, especially if the judge is unaware or insensitive to stereotypes he or she is using to define or characterize minority groups and women. When the stereotypes are inaccurate or based on outmoded concepts that reinforce established patterns of discrimination and existing inequities, the judicial decision has the effect of perpetuating inequality. The conference papers I co-edited with my colleague Sheila Martin, who now is a senior judge, was the first collection of its kind in Canada. Its title is Equality and Judicial Neutrality, and to my surprise, I found that it's 
on the web uh, in Amazon uh, books. <laughs> I thought it was a print a long time ago. After the publication of the book, and after working on a team with Judge Doug Campbell, as he then was, he later was promoted to be a senior federal court judge, at the time was chair of the Western Judicial Education Center. <laughs> judicial education in Canada on gender and other forms of bias in judicial decision making rapidly expanded over the next se several years, after which the National Judicial Institute was founded, and I'm sure you're going to hear about that from Bertel. Um, the judicial education movement grew not only in Canada during that time, but I also participated in the early development of judicial education programs on gender, race, ethnic, and other issues of structural inequality in Australia, and that's where I met Livingston, uh, South Africa, India, Vietnam, and Israel. In all of these countries, as different as they are in terms of culture, race, ethnicity, population, geography, governance, and wealth, they all shared the same problem of bias when it came to dealing with issues pertaining to equality of women and minorities. By the late 80s and early 90s, academics from coast to coast in Canada were critiquing judgments for gender and other forms of inequality. Test case litigation was successfully challenging biased assumptions and stereotypes in the jurisprudence and legislation. More women were appointed to the bench than ever before, and law schools admitted a majority of women. Judicial education sessions between 1988 and 1992 were frequent and well attended, focusing on topics such as violence against women, racial bias, aboriginal concerns, intersecting multiple disadvantage, treatment of child witnesses, the economics of divorce, and numerous other topics taught with the goal of achieving equality. Judges confronted their own preconceptions and re-examined legal principles and procedures for biases many had never recognized before. The promise of equality in the Canadian Charter seemed to be being fulfilled. Some of the more noteworthy judicial decisions of the time defined equality as being substantive and results orientated rather than as a formal sameness of treatment concept. Once the substantive equality foundation was laid down, the door was opened for the Supreme Court to find that pregnancy discrimination and sexual harassment were indeed <coughs> sexual discrimination. That questioning a woman about her past sexual history was unconstitutional. And where battered women were concerned, a gendered perspective would find that self-defense, based on a barroom brawl model, could not be fairly applied to women, and that the test must be based on a female normative standard when the accused before the court was a female. A decision on access to abortion was decided with women in the center of the analysis. In her legal reasoning, the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada, Bertha Wilson, focused on the well-being and dignity of Canadian women, taking into account their experiences, their unique reproductive capacity, their struggle for more equitable treatment. She developed an approach to legal reasoning that was more aware of the context surrounding a case so as to alleviate gendered injustice. Using this contextual approach, she led the court in deciding that an abortion decision early in the pregnancy must be solely the woman's decision, not a decision of the state. Justice Claire Levy Dubay, the second woman appointed to our highest court, dispelled a number of female stereotypes and myths that affected the development of Canadian legal analysis, especially in family and criminal law. Her vision, was to change the language of the law and to make all judges gender sensitive, believing that women judges alone cannot be relied upon to impact the social change that needs to occur if women were to be equal with men in Canadian society. In family law, for example, she noted the stereotypes businessmen have of business women and childcare, that all childcare costs are shared equally. She noted, however, that women as a rule, disproportionately incur childcare expenses as well as the social costs of raising children. 
In another family law case, she gave legal recognition to the disproportionate impact that childbearing, marriage, and divorce have on women. And although the Divorce Act is drafted in gender neutral language, its practical effects have often gender consequences if incorrect stereotypes drive the decision making process. She instilled a contextual approach, as Justice Wilson did, attempting to ground family law in both common sense and reality. In doing so, she rejected the self sufficiency <coughs> of the divorce and replaced it with a compensatory framework that more adequately responds to the actual reality of many divorced women. Most of the positive landmark equality cases were discrimination cases based on one enumerated ground. Very few cases that involved intersecting forms of disadvantage were taken before the court, and even fewer, I must say, succeeded. As time went on, the equality gains of the 80s and 90s started to disappear as the court's application of the equality provisions became more and more complex. For example, in an important Supreme Court of Canada case involving Aboriginal women, the court did not examine the context of the long history of Native women's disadvantage and subordination, both in the white community as well as in their own communities, before deciding the case. This resulted in a decision where Native women were denied the resources uh, to allow them to be present at the constitutional negotiating table where the rights of Aboriginal people were being negotiated. The court held that the male-dominated Indian organizations could speak for them. In another Supreme Court decision, the court did not strike down a welfare regulation in the stereo, uh, no, rooted in the stereotype that young, unemployed persons are lazy and unmotivated. Instead, finding that a reduction in welfare benefits below basic survival needs for destitute young people under 30 was really to their benefit and not a violation of equality guarantees because the scheme happened to include an educational program. The plaintiff in that case had turned to survival prostitution in order to make ends meet. In another double disadvantage case, the stereotypical thinking that disabled people cannot fit into regular society led to the court upholding the administrative tribunal's decision to take a disabled child out of the school classroom, separating her from her peers when she was quite capable of integrating with them, reminiscent of the old separate but equal approach to difference. One of the most dis disappointing decisions of late is the Supreme Court's decision to <coughs> uphold legislation denying common law spouses in Quebec the right to, to claim support or the right to divide family property, notwithstanding the fact that they form long-standing unions, they divide household responsibilities, they develop a high degree of interdependence, and, economic, and the economically dependent spouse is faced with the same disadvantages when the relationship dissolves as married spouses do. The Supreme Court of Canada in this case, it seems to me, failed to consider the disproportionate impact the decision could have on women in these relationships. Instead, it found that the Quebec Civil Code was not discriminatory, emphasizing that the objective of the Quebec support law is to preserve freedom of choice and respect the dignity and autonomy of common law relationships. Violence against women, as Justice Russell pointed out, remains a very serious problem in society and in the operation of the law. All the studies indicate that it is a particularly serious problem for Aboriginal women, poor women, and ethnic and racial minority women. One only has to look at the example of what has been acknowledged about the treatment of Aboriginal women and girls in Canada by the justice system in the report of the British Columbia Murdered and Missing Women Inquiry to understand the extent and depth of the problem. The report found that starting in the 1960s, there has been over 1,200 unsolved cases of missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada. Undocumented and unreported instances are thought to run much higher. But the criminal law jurisprudence on violence against women shows a discernible shift away from the enlightened reforms made earlier to rid the law of sexually discriminatory myths and stereotypes when sexual assault cases come before the courts. Back in 1983, feminist analyses and advocacy resulted in a major overhaul of criminal code offenses of rape. 
Courts and Parliament implemented a conceptual shift of rape as a product of unequal power relationship structure by society in which women's sexuality is commodified. The crime was recast as a form of assault, not only to contest narrow societal understandings of rape, but also to undo the myriad of sex discriminatory rules for the legal processing of rape, such as permitting women to be cross-examined with respect to their prior sexual experience. In 1983, the term rape was abolished, as was the spousal immunity for rape, and a new three-tiered crime of sexual assault was enacted to capture degrees of additional violence perpetrated against women when they are sexually assaulted. The reformed laws also introduced significant changes to the rules of evidence that undermine women's credibility as witnesses. Yet in spite of the legal paradigm shift achieved in 1983, public, media, and legal discourses around the crime of sexual assault today remains mired in old concepts, myths, and stereotypes. Former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Claire Louis Dubay described the myths and stereotypes applied to rape victims. She said that some of these stereotypes are women fantasize about being rape victims, that women mean yes even when they say no, that any woman could successfully resist a rapist if she really wanted to, that the sexually experienced do not suffer harms when raped, or at least suffer lesser harms than the sexually innocent. That women often deserve to be raped on account of their conduct, dress, and demeanor. That rape by a stranger is worse than one by an acquaintance. <coughs> one new myth is the notion that somehow sexual assault is inherently less serious and harmful than rape, with resulting public confusion over when and how these terms should be used. Researcher Shannon Sampart studied 1,532 press articles to demonstrate that the myths associated with sexual assault cases in the courts are mirrored in the broader society. She documents how journalists and journalistic conventions positions rape as a sex crime as opposed to an act of violence and portrays women victims as dishonest and male perpetrators as innocent. In another of her studies, she examined a popular radio posts daily news analysis showing how equality rights are framed and expressed in a way that promotes class, race, and gender antagonisms, creating the impression that ordinary Canadians are in a struggle for power with special interest groups, including minorities and women. This form of backlash threatens to further discredit equality agendas and narrow the scope of equality claims. When these myths and stereotypes inform judicial thinking, consciously or unconsciously, Reporting, con reporting, conviction, and sentencing decisions can be seriously affected. The BC Women's Hospital and Healthcare Centre in Vancouver recently conducted a study which showed that of 568 sexual assault files opened over a two-year period, only 48 were re resulted in going to court, and of that, only 18 <coughs> resulted in convictions. This very low conviction rate is of considerable concern and it is thought uh, to relate to continuing negative views about women's credibility. There may be other reasons, obviously, of course, but it is certainly worthy of further research and analysis and judicial attention. <coughs> when there's been any suggestion that women judges might bring a different approach to these matters, the backlash, the backlash has been swift. After she gave her famous lecture of Will Women Judges Make a Difference, in 1990, Justice Bertha Wilson was criticized for being a feminist, for playing politics, for having a personal agenda, and of not being impartial for suggesting that women might bring alternative perspectives to judging. Justice Larue Dubay herself was the object of a scurrilous public uh, outcry for speaking about judicial use of stereotypes in rape cases. Among other things, she was accused by the same judge she criticized in an open letter to a national newspaper of, of a graceless slide into personal invective. Um, the depiction of such eminent jurists as Bertha Wilson and Claire Lou Dubay as ill-suited to judicial office serves to reinforce the perception of a woman judge as a threat to the order of law rather than a benefit. A similar pattern is observable in judicial appointments in Canada today. While law schools graduate more women than men and the bar is more or less gender balanced, Recent federal appointments to the bench grossly underrepresent women and minorities. 
Presently in Canada, there are 382 female judges out of the 1,100 sitting judges, or about 35%. Last year, only eight women, about 16% of the 41 appointments, were appointed to the federal judiciary. In the past five years of the 197 federal appointments made, just three were people of color. In June of this year, our federal justice minister Peter McKay, who controls all of the federal appointments to the judiciary, stunned several lawyers at a meeting of the Ontario Bar Association when he was asked about the dearth of women and visible minorities uh, on federally appointed courts. His response was that they just weren't applying for the jobs. McKay went on to frame his justification in terms of motherhood stereotypes, opining that women fear an old boys network on the bench would dispatch them on circuit work to hear cases in courthouses across the region, a prospect he described as unappealing for women with children at home, hmm. and he then referenced his wife at home with their young child as an example. The Justice Minister's acceptance of the traditional stereotype that women's places in the home is bad enough, by totally ignoring the part of the question that asked him about the dearth of minority appointments to the judiciary, he appeared to, to see the question as irrelevant or unimportant. The most recent data on ju judicial appointments indicates the typical lawyer appointed to the bench is, is a white 53-year-old male civil litigator practicing in a firm of more than 60 lawyers. In other words, from firms that don't as a rule practice family law, human rights, immigration law, or aboriginal rights, which of course are areas of particular concern to women and minorities. In conclusion then, and I know I'm just about out of time, uh, there has no doubt been significant progress for some women since 1986 when that first conference on the socialization of judges to equality issues took place. However, it is wrong to conclude that equality exists for all equality seekers, particularly those women who face co combinations of disadvantage, including poverty, aboriginality, racism, disabilities, old age, immigrant and refugee status, or a different sexual orientation. Equality is a moving target, and judicial education must keep pace with shifts in political culture and an increasingly diverse population. Judges must be sensitive to increasingly insidious forms of discrimination, hone their abilities to critically evaluate existing concepts of equality, and their capacity to formulate new methods of thought and understanding the commitment to equality requires. New emerging stereotypes must be challenged, such as the one that says Canadian men and women are equal now in terms of income and status. If courts accept this stereotype, they could be, in fact, widening the gap that already exists. Within Canada, the current popular thought is the individual is responsible for his or her success, and innate barriers for women no longer exist. Another Supreme Court of Canada Justice, Rosalie Bella, co commented on this myth. She said, for every woman in the thousands whose glass ceilings have been melted, shattered, or raised, there are women in the millions who think that a glass ceiling is just one more household object to polish. <laughs> there is still a huge gap between what the public thinks has happened to women, because several thousand have had the luck, the guts, finances, friends, encouragement, or supportive partners to break barriers, and what is really happening for the majority of women. She says these women are waiting for equality to hit home. They are waiting for the rhetoric of equality that they can hear to turn into the reality of equality that they can live. Judicial education programs, in my opinion, need to constantly address complex equality issues so that judges can readily identify the arguments and principles that un unfairly override full consideration of the values, interests, and abilities of disadvantaged or minority groups. Judges should be asked to consider what would equality look like if women's perspectives were taken seriously? What if realities of poverty, disability, racialization, exclusion, and power were placed in the center of equality law and not at the margins? If we took substantive equality seriously, how would our law and our world be different? Judges should inquire into the question about why has the jurisprudence failed to deliver on the promise of equality? Why are the courts not recognizing real-world dynamics and harms caused by systemic discrimination? Judicial decisions should strive to present an alternative vision, to think creatively and critically about equality as a constitutional goal, to examine choices made and whether these choices advance equality. 
Questions should be asked about how evidence is treated, what dynamics are unquestioned or unexamined, and how do we think about remedies. Judicial education should allow judges to critically analyze existing case law, identify and question the steps in the judgment's logic, and present new lines of legal argument. Ultimately, judicial education should open up the judicial dialogue into a broader conversation that truly hears the voices of those in need of the equality rights they are told they have. As Justice Bertha Wilson stated, in order to change the legal culture, to have it absorb new ideas and, change, and shape them into legal doctrine, much more needs to be done. Thank you for that. Sesame Street uh, uh, episode or a segment they would have, which one of these does not belong, which one of these is not like the other, uh, that would be me. Um, in part because, as you could tell from my title, um, it's about uh, international arbitration and what you might, or you'll see is a sort of accidental encounter um, with judicial education. So I'm not going to try to answer some of the grander questions uh, that the first two panelists addressed, um, but we'll instead focus on uh, what was, uh, what's been my experience, uh, sort of quite accidentally, with judicial education. And I will say, in my own defense, that when uh, Stacy first invited me to this conference, I did say, are you sure uh, that you want me to, to come? Do I have and why? And the first thought was actually one project that Stacy and I work on together with international arbitration, and that's the uh, restatement on international arbitration. Um, which its primary target, uh, primary intended audience actually is judges. Um, and of course, Stacy's work uh, with the Judicial Center and her very fine judicial manual on international arbitration as starting points of, okay, well, maybe that's my point of entry. Um, but I, I wasn't quite sure I could really talk about judicial education out of those. Uh, and so I again wrote, are you sure, are you sure? Yes, yes, are you sure? So it, I started wringing out of every experience I've ever had uh, any sort of semblance of judicial education. It did occur to me that I have um, some experiences, mainly through my work trying to promote uh, international arbitration. Um, and there are specifically three experiences which I'll describe from which I have wrung some hopefully interesting ideas about uh, international judicial education. Um, so the three experiences are my work in Palestine, uh, in Georgia, the one near Russia, uh, <coughs> down south, uh, and in China. Um, and, uh, and my, my uh, thinking about this is how and why, despite the fact that I had no intention of engaging in judicial education, I did end up doing some, and whether, therefore, international arbitration um, can end up, in a sense, promoting judicial education in various countries around the world focusing on essentially developing and emerging uh, economies. So uh, I'm going to, uh, get a little more anecdotal and, and personal than I usually am, I'll tell you about each of these three projects and how I ended up in them and how they ended up, in a sense, getting me involved in judicial training. The first is something uh, I, I became interested uh, in the uh, international arbitration in the region in the, in between Israel and, and Palestine because of the formation of a new um, arbitration center called the Judicial, uh, excuse me, the uh, Jerusalem Arbitration Center. And I read basically a little press release that said they're going to, that every year there's about four or five billion, B billion dollars in trade between Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, and that, not surprisingly, a number of commercial disputes arise out of these exchanges. Um, and, you know, uh, Palestinians don't feel particularly comfortable in Israeli courts seeking justice, and Israelis are actually uh, completely barred from appearing or being represented in Palestinian courts. So where do these commercial disputes get resolved? And they were creating this new arbitration center to resolve these disputes. My scholarship, even if under the umbrella of ethics, is really concerned with fairness in process. And so my, the thing that immediately leapt to my mind is you have a world-class uh, legal uh, system and set of lawyers in Israel, uh, outstanding Israeli uh, arbitrators, and on the other side, you know, for the Palestinians who are supposedly going to be participating in these processes, you, you just, you know, there just isn't uh, very much for obvious reasons. Um, so my original point of entry was this, you know, apparent disparity and focus on lawyer and <coughs> arbitrator training. And I showed up in the region and uh, started working um, on with the local Palestinians on lawyer and arbitrator training. But it very quickly became clear 
um, that they also had judicial issues, right? Because they had never had an international arbitration award enforced in the Palestinian territories, but they had a 42% rate of enforcement of domestic arbitration awards. For those of you who don't do international arbitration or arbitration at all, that's a terrible, terrible, uh, we're aiming for something close to 100% with only cases that have these very uh, uh, unusual procedural problems come up uh, as being a basis for non-enforcement. So 42% so is quite abysmal. I will tell you some of the reasons for that, um, and we might actually be glad that it's so low uh, historically, but certainly it signaled the need to change the judicial role, which necessarily means judicial education. So I engaged a lot of capacity building for lawyers and arbitrators there, and it turned out the judges were um, in part at the pressing of the Ministry of Justice showing up at our uh, training sessions. Um, the second uh, reason I've become involved in, in judicial uh, education to some extent is my topic of ethics. Um, and so uh, it is sort of the obsession du jour in international arbitration. Um, and it's a, um, it's a, in part because it's a vehicle or for overtly signaling uh, legitimacy of particular institutions. Um, and so, uh, for example, in Georgia, in an effort to promote both international and domestic arbitration, um, there's been a great deal of activity drafting a code of ethics for arbitrators. And that was actually why I was invited there, because of my specialty, they had me come and uh, talk about how to implement um, uh, the, uh, the, the new code of ethics so that it would be effective. Okay, uh, and, uh, and, and interestingly enough, when we were at this conference talking about arbitrator ethics, um, there were judges in the audience from um, Georgia, including one I'll tell you in a bit, uh, that gave me, I think, the very best quote that illustrates to the extent I have a thesis, uh, my thesis. Okay. The third way, I, or the third reason why I've sort of become involved in judicial uh, training or judicial education is quite frankly because lots of resources are being poured into promoting international arbitration. So USAID, the EU, various international organizations are, are sponsoring lots of programs in, a, in, a, in an effort to promote international arbitration. Um, but what that means is that a lot of resources are being poured into these programs. Um, they get a lot of attention in these countries, and for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, that I think ends up translating into some important reasons why these programs can have uh, important implications for judicial uh, training or judicial capacity building. Um, before I go into a little further, I'm going to give you a little bit of vocabulary because since we're all here about judges, I'm not so sure that you are um, aware of the, of the distinct terminology I'm going to refer to a little bit. So I'm going to say there are basically three categories of international arbitration. There's international commercial arbitration, which is basically when two parties from different countries have a contract, um, they put in an arbitration clause, um, neither wants to be in each other's courts. That's sort of the model for the Jerusalem Arbitration Center I was just talking about. Or, you know, most commercial transactions, it's estimated between 80-90% of international commercial contracts have um, such clauses, again, because neither wants to be in each other's courts. That's my primary focus professionally. Um, there is also a newer phenomenon you might be reading about a lot because it's been in the news, something called investment arbitration, which is also relevant to this story, both the promotion and, to some extent, criticisms uh, or, or skepticism about international arbitration and its value for judicial education. And that's investment arbitration, and particularly, for example, when a, um, an, a foreign investor is investing in a state and there might be an expropriation, there are treaties that permit that investor, instead of having to go to the local courts of that state, to bring what is called a bilateral investment treaty claim or an, or an investor state claim, it's sometimes called, or investment arbitration claim. That is an area that is, uh, there's a great deal of controversy about right now, the legitimacy of that form of arbitration, um, its effect on states, um, but we'll, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Interestingly enough, notwithstanding uh, to some extent my attempts to disavow any knowledge of a relationship with domestic arbitration in part because in, in the US system it's, it's quite <coughs> for my for my practice and to some extent some of the concerns that exist in the U.S. Are, are things that I share, so I've purposely sort of steered away from domestic arbitration. But we'll talk about domestic arbitration because it actually turns out, I think, to be part of the story about why international arbitration plugs into, uh, in a sense, judicial training. 
So um, I'm going to start, so with that sort of uh, description or, or set of um, definitions, I'll tell you that there's a, there are actually some people who said, you know what, Tra all this training in international arbitration does not strengthen uh, local judiciaries. In fact, it undermines them. So a couple of quotes, Tom Ginsburg, and these are mostly tied to investment arbitration for some particular reasons, but I think they can extend to um, commercial arbitration as well. So Thomas Ginsburg says, um, the decision to bypass domestic courts may reduce courts through arbitration processes, okay, may reduce courts' incentives to improve performance by de depriving key actors from a need to invest in institutional development. Okay. Um, Susan Frank, who's also a colleague of, of uh, Stacey and mine, says, foreign investors rationally refrain from championing good and generalized law reforms in developing states, preferring instead to protect their interests by relying on a uh, bilateral investment treaty rule, uh, rule of law enclave. So there's almost an affirmative incentive, the argument is, by investors to not let local institutions develop, to hinder that development because that in increases the prevalence of investment arbitration that at least some people say uh, is sort of captured by the interests of these investors. Um, uh, in, uh, in addition, Ron Daniels um, goes even a bit further. He says bilateral investment arbitration uh, enfeebles host state governments and in sharp contrast made uh, uh, to the in sharp contrast to the claims made by its supporters, it will end up discrediting uh, its own legitimacy by, um, in a sense, undermining the uh, institutions that it's supposedly protecting investors uh, against. Um, so in sum, these commentators all feel that um, the only internal impetuses for change can lead to meaningful institutional improvement, in, particularly in local judiciaries, and that no external force, no matter how noble, um, can compel uh, or strengthen the local rule of law in these, in these places. And that uh, is sort of my challenge, is that I, I think I disagree quite strongly with these, with some caveats. Um, and it's based on work on the ground, um, you know, probably cumulatively several months over the past five years, mostly in Palestine. But when I go to these places, um, it's necessarily a slightly longer engagement than just showing up at a conference and giving a talk. You talk uh, extensively with the locals to understand what's going on. You're working on them before you go and when you come back on law reform efforts. Um, and so these are uh, very anecdotal. But I think um, the fact that there's some uh, consistent experience among these very different jurisdictions suggests that there might be something there. So what are the problems in these local courts? And they have all the problems that were described, okay, all of those problems, but way more uh, fundamental, okay? So a lot of these are very new judiciaries. Um, they don't have established uh, traditions or even constitutional uh, mandates for judicial independence. Even the concept of judicial independence hasn't really taken hold in some of these jurisdictions. Um, political favoritism is in, in particularly, for example, in Palestine is how judges got appointed. Um, and there's a lack, therefore, of um, training and skills. Uh, in China, for example, one of the big criticisms is that there are judges who are illiterate um, out in some of the provinces. They are paid woefully inadequate uh, compensation. Uh, the, um, so much so, it is not a prestigious profession, um, so it does not attract the best and the brightest. In fact, it attracts, you know, that's why you end up with some illiterate judges, because um, you have a combination of political cronyism and sort of whoever's left over when everyone else got the good jobs who are uh, standing in um, for judges. And not to denigrate, actually, the entire uh, Chinese judiciary with that, because I, I met some extraordinary um, uh, incredibly thoughtful, progressive uh, judges at the, uh, we had the privilege of, of being at the um, um, Chinese um, Supreme Court. Um, and I, I realized I described my Palestinian experience and then skipped over the part with my, in my haste, over the two other experiences. So if I can go back just a moment, then I'll, I'll, I'll go back uh, to, to where I was. So Georgia, I, I, I did say, I ended up there because of the ethics. China actually was a bit of a, um, an unusual one that I'll just highlight, I was there with something called the International Judicial Academy. Um, and it was a, uh, they basically exist only on grant sponsored, uh, grant funded sponsorship. And so they apply um, for different grants. And it turns out, and this is part of I think the story, lots of the grants, um, particularly for certain jurisdictions, are tied to international arbitration. 
So they're, a, they're an institution totally focused on judicial education, primarily through these really fascinating judicial exchanges. So they take judges from the United States, they send them to China and take Chinese judges and bring them here and other jurisdictions throughout the world as well. Um, but they were increasingly noticing, and specifically they got a grant for judicial education in China, but it was premised on that it had to focus on international arbitration. And so that's sort of how I got invited there as an academic, not a judge, um, because they needed somebody who knew something about international arbitration um, in, that, in that process. So with that uh, slight uh, backtracking, uh, let me go back. So um, to where I am. So the problems that we're talking about in these different jurisdictions, including China, and the reason I mentioned uh, I wanted to backtrack is just because it was such an interesting experience through this organization to meet also with the, the People's um, Supreme Court in China. Um, and they, they are doing really amazing things, but if you talk about a judiciary that has you know, profound challenges, um, the Chinese uh, judiciary really really does, and obviously uh, you know, not a tradition of um, judicial independence, um, in fact, uh, a, a sort of precariousness to any attempt to assert, assert uh, judicial independence in certain uh, instances. Um, they have case management challenges. Um, in a lot of these d developing and emerging economies, um, responding to correspondence, a, a postal system that works um, is sort of unusual. You know, some of these basic fundamental resources that we have that make our judicial system work don't function very well. Um, as a result, there's a, um, a sense that, okay, if you, if you respond to every third correspondence, that's not so bad. Um, the, um, and so some of this it's sort of what you might call good business practices just don't exist in some of these jurisdictions. In addition, and I think this is probably one of the most pervasive ones, we said that there's not a strong commitment or concept of judicial independence, but there's also a, a sort of corollary of that. There's a commitment to personal values and oftentimes relationships that are considered valid reasons for decision making. Um, so, you know, really in contrast to our notions of judicial decision making, um, that you know magnifies the types of concerns that were expressed earlier um, about inequality um, and uh, particularly um, when you talk about something like religious freedom. So, in in Georgia, actually, I learned while I was there, it's, it's an Orthodox country, um, and the Patriarch of Georgia is incredibly important politically um, on various issues. And so as a result, um, you know, the idea that you would uh, put aside religious values in making a, ju a judgment, for example, about someone from a different religion, not very well uh, valued or, or highly respected. Um, and obviously in Palestine, they actually do have a, um, uh, several different religions that are implicated there, most obviously Christianity and uh, Islam, um, but uh, Islam being much more dominant and uh, in fact Sharia courts being uh, an important a place where um, some of these issues get played out. I'll come back to that in a minute with, with regard to arbitration. So I think there are three reasons, and I'm going to do it in less than five minutes, three reasons why training in international arbitration, I, I would argue, um, can strengthen judicial capacity building in these developing countries. Um, one, I think that there are ties to, or there's sort of summary, and I'll give you examples, there are ties, this training ties um, into, or, or uh, locks into local institutions um, particularly um, the ministries of justice, the judiciary, <coughs> and uh, local arbitration institutions. Um, and it has, it, it is um, driven by a lot of local incentives by, by uh, elites who I'll talk about in just a moment, business and, lo and legal elites. Um, this is all very counterintuitive um, because the, uh, with the, I'll start with actually the role of elites. Um, it's sort of counterintuitive because we oftentimes think of elites in a society as benefiting from uh, extra legal influence that they have. But in fact, in these countries, um, it's oftentimes the elites who are the ones who invite or organize these conferences for international arbitration. They also have the great, certainly the legal elites have the greatest um, incentives to have development of the rule of law. Why? Because if there's no law, they don't really have much of a job, per se. Um, that's what lawyers do. Um, uh, and so they also, and, and because they are looking for predictability in some of their um, financial investments, they have an interest in political stability and rule of law. More, much more specifically, and sort of, uh, I wouldn't have sort of intuited this until I was there, is that because they're the ones who invite uh, internationals there, they have to learn to walk the walk and talk about inter, you know, independence and impartiality. Um, and that is how they have these corresponding relationships and conversations with these international elites who they invite in. 
Um, and those conversations then, I think, translate into local incentives by these elites who actually then hold a lot of power and influence um, and turn into, in a sense, a local interest. Okay? Um, the judicial training, um, this is also seems somewhat counterintuitive. International arbitration is all about taking disputes away from courts. Um, and in fact, historically, in every jurisdiction in the world, there's always been some sort of antipathy between courts, which have to enforce awards for arbitration to work, but to some extent feel like they're being, having their cases uh, taken away from them. Um, and so what you're really talking about when you're talking about training for international arbitration is training judges to refrain from exercising their power, okay? Um, which has a little bit of counterintuitives. Why is there so much uh, money and, and attention being uh, channeled into judicial training then? Because one, for the New York Convention, which is the primary treaty that facilitates enforcement of international arbitration to work really well internationally, it has to be interpreted consistently across countries. And that means training judges in how they, what the international interpretation is. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing that is interesting, again, about judicial training, so as more of an anecdote, but I think a, a, an example here. So one of the things that happened with the Jerusalem Arbitration Center, I told you there's this 42% enforcement rate. Once you start realizing there are problems, you start revising the law. But if you revise your arbitration law, your local, internet, your local arbitration law, to make it consistent with international standards, and those revisions are pushed by those elites we were just talking about, you then need to train the judges to interpret that law properly, right? And in fact, in Jerusalem, in, the, in support of the Jerusalem Arbitration Center, one of the things they're doing with their new arbitration law is designating only specific judges, a handful of judges, who can hear international arbitration awards when they're challenged. Okay, now that's really important because it increases accountability, it increases um, transparency in these decision making, and it makes judicial training Okay, about how you recognize and enforce awards, much easier to do. Um, in addition, you might imagine somewhere down the line, as these uh, arbitrate these judges specialized on arbitration are more in the spotlight, they might pro um, provide some sort of very visible signal about what it means to be at an international level a, a good judge. Um, and the other thing that the last point that I'll make, which is, was surprising to me, to be honest, and something I sort of resisted. And something most international arbitration people resist is the link between international and domestic arbitration. And the reason why this is sort of surprising is because, well, to start with a very famous quote by uh, Jan Paulson, a very famous international arbitrator, he says uh, you know, they, uh, that uh, international arbitration is to domestic arbitration what star horses are to horses. Okay? Um, they sound a lot alike, but they're really, really different. Um, and, and in fact, the fact that they sound alike is very misleading. Um, so I had also kind of been skeptical about domestic arbitration because I like um, national judges doing implying national law for local constituencies and sometimes wish that our uh, domestic arbitration law uh, didn't allow such things as employment discrimination or certain types of claims to go to arbitration. Um, but in these institutions, what's happening, or in these sorry, excuse me, in these contexts, what's happening is the the bringing in of international resources and attention on international arbitration which these elites see as opening up opportunities for greater investment and access to international markets, they also see as important for developing and helping to push along domestic arbitration. And this was my experience in, uh, in Palestine, where they are using the resources and international training that's coming in also to develop their domestic arbitration, um, and in Georgia in particular. Um, and one of the things that my, my favorite quote I said I would give you um, from a Georgian judge who's in the audience there, we were talking about this, uh, this eth code of ethics for Georgian arbitrators, mostly domestic, but also inter but using international, uh, basically mo their code is model stolen, to be honest, from an international code, okay? And, um, and we were talking about implementation and the standards and this Georgian judge in, in, uh, in Georgia, so I was on the earphones and I cannot quote it back to you exactly because it was through translation, but he says, well, you know, if you keep increasing the type of impartiality and the ethical standards for arbitrators, you're just going to put more and more pressure on us judges also to be better. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating. So this last piece that I'm going to say is international arbitration and focus on the quality of justice, quality of decision making in international and then sort of by, by extension domestic arbitration, I do think can put meaningful um, pressure, um, if for no other reason by example, hey, if, our, if effective adjudication is happening over there privately, why can't you manage it? 
Um, and so I think that that also will come up. Now, the, I'm not going to close with this pen. I mean, this is a, a, you know, a paid-for uh, commercial interruption for international arbitration or domestic yeah. arbitration, um, because there were some big issues about arbitrators, too. So in Palestine, the big problem that they've had is a lot of their um, arbitrators have been essentially uh, Sharia, you know, small tribal arbitration where the decisions were, you know, in many ways quite terrible, which is why that enforcement rate's so low and we kind of like it to be low because the, the decisions were, were just bad and unfair. Um, in Georgia, they actually had this amazing phenomenon. One of their tasks is actually to raise the quality of arbitrators and also the perception of arbitrators because you did not need to have judicial recognition of an award before you enforced it and executed it. So they would have these sham arbitrations, evidently, where two parties would uh, have a piece of property, they'd have the arbitrate, and neither had any relationship to the property, but they'd have an arbitrator decide which of them was entitled to it, and then they would go execute on this award. And so one of them would actually end up with title that the actual owner would have to then go challenge. And various other types of either money laundering or um, fantastic um, uh, ruses in international arbitration. So, so that is also you know, a problem they face is in improving the actual quality of arbitration. But I do think um, somewhat counterintuitively and certainly counter to the scholars that we were talking about, that training in international arbitration, because it's not just airlifted in ideas saying you need to be more impartial uh, as a judge, um, but because it involves the judges in, and involves foreign and international standards in the lawmaking, in the judicial training that's inevitably important for international arbitration, I think it has some role to play internationally for international arbitration. I, uh, with that, I'm sorry I've kept you longer than I promised, uh, but thank you also for tolerating something so off subject. <laughs> so, we have, with Stacey's permission, we have time for just one or two questions before we take a 15 minute, 10 minute break. It's going to be a get the coffee and come back. Get it? Okay, all right. Uh, uh, sorry. So, we do have questions, one or two questions. That, Um, I'm, I'm very curious, I, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna preface this, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, 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 I'm here to, I'm, I'm doing an a education on judicial leadership, okay? Um, on the, from the International Court, okay? So I'm very interested in both of y'all's perspectives on this. Um, especially you, I'm both, uh, uh, Russell, uh, you brought up a, a several issues on on the individual traits for judges, and that's what I'm looking at, is what are the, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, the individual uh, leadership traits for judicial actors within, within the international court. You brought up a s several identified uh, leadership traits. However, nobody here on the, on the panel, and I'm just kind of, kind of, kind of curious why Leadership is not brought into as a as a as a arbitrator or as a you know what you were talking about. Why is that? The, and, and it's just I know it may be a stupid question, but I'm just kind of asking. Why is it that leadership is not in judicial leadership is not addressed in the judicial and the legal perspectives as a competency and, and as a training issue. I'll, I'll say, I think I didn't use the word leadership, but I would say, for example, there's, or perhaps the precise concept of leadership, but I think, um, for example, I, I, I think also in some jur jurisdictions, judicial leadership is an oxymoron because there's no judicial independence, so how, you know, they're supposed to just follow the political branches in the places I'm talking about, so that's part of why it's not an entirely easy fit. Um, but I do think, for example, when I was talking about um, specialized judges uh, appointed in, in Ramallah to be the, um, the, arbit the, the ones who hear the arbitration cases, I'm talking about them being set up as in a, in a role model or leadership position for other judges uh, to, to follow. So I didn't use that terminology, um, and I think it might be a, a harder um, one to bring in, again, because in some of these jurisdictions, judges aren't regarded as very respected. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, I think it is also relevant, perhaps just under slightly different terminology. Um, That'd be my answer for my. Case. Well, it, from from my perspective, I think that when when I was involved in a lot of judicial education, this is a touchy uh, subject as a quality in many contexts, and it was very very important that leadership 
um, was taking place in terms of legitimizing the concept. So I'll, I too didn't use the exact words of leadership, but it's certainly critically important in judicial education initiatives, especially when you are talking about topics such as equality and uh, judicial gender, race uh, biases and things like that, that um, if you have the leadership of the Chief Justice or some of the judges I cited on the Supreme Court of Canada, it makes all the difference in the world in terms of acceptance by other judges uh, that this is a legitimate topic and something that should be pursued. So leadership is with, without a doubt a critically important facet uh, of judicial education in my experience. In in my paper, I talk about the Leadership Institute that we have implemented in our state judiciary, and I unfortunately had to cut things <laughs> because my presentation was too long to begin with, but um, just last year, our Judicial Education um, 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 Unit of the Judiciary has formed a um, Missouri Court Management Institute, and this institute is not only for judges, but it's for other court personnel and, and, and the, the, the leadership sessions are held across all levels of the judiciary and all employment um, facets of the judiciary. So it's a session in which juvenile officers and the chief justice and clerk clerks are all in the same leadership component. And um, uh, we started with a uh, two and a half day workshop and um, it's gonna be an annual event, um, but with, with different people um, um, uh, so that all the judiciary at some point can participate.